A Hunter-Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century. This is our book uh, that we've been talking about writing for well over a decade. I remember being in a comparative anatomy lab with students back in like 2010, um, talking about our ideas for this book. And um, it's finally come to fruition. We're super excited about it. Um, we encourage you to uh, to look at the site and to um, consider pre-ordering. We, at the moment, um, there's there's people have been asking about getting signed copies, and there's not a way for us to interact with the publisher such that we can actually sign copies and get them to people. Um, but two things, uh, we're likely to put up a, a button here soon. Um, that any time that you have pre-ordered, you would be able to go in and uh, enter your information and get a signed book plate, which is not the same. Um, but we're also hoping to do some live events in the fall. Uh, and there will also be uh, more information about that coming coming soon. But at live events, uh, if they have, you know, we, we will be trying to do some in places where there's actual interest. And if you showed up to that, there will be book signings as part of that. We would far prefer to sign actual books. Yes. It seems the right way to us as well. But if you think about the logistical problem of getting the books to the pen and then to you, it, it becomes a, well. That's actually that it's it's not the books to the pen and the books to you. It's the it's the uh, it's the contractual agreement with the with the publisher. Oh, there's an additional layer that I uh, yeah I yeah figured no out the yet. the physical stuff <clears throat> I, I I got that figured, but it's the it's the contractual stuff that we would need another another uh, structure or something. But yeah yeah. Uh, so, I will say also on the point on the uh, from the point of view of looking at the website, uh, probably most of you will encounter things on your phones because that's what's done. But you should go see if you can't dig up a a, a laptop somewhere to look at the site from the uh, the desktop because um, all of you who have been begging for a parallax scroll, you will only it's not a parallax scroll. There's a parallax scroll. Mm, you know, so let's not go here. That <laughs> it didn't end up being what happened. So. Um, it was, sure looks like one. It's an animation rather than a parallax scroll. We do not need to go inside baseball on this, but the, the guys who are working on this did an amazing job, and there were uh, internal technical reasons as it's to why. It's better they... than a parallax scroll. We simulated a parallax scroll with animation, which is even cooler. So check that out on the desktop site. Indeed. Um, so what we are going to do over the next 13 weeks or so, um, if you would just scroll up a little bit, Zach, is each week we're going to do a segment of the podcast devoted to um, one of the chapters. And so um, I'll just read for those of you listening and not looking the names of the chapters. And so starting whenever our next live stream is, um, <clears throat> we will do a little excerpt from and discuss the human niche and then a brief history of the human lineage, which is the deep history of, of life, our life on earth, ancient bodies, modern world, chapter four is medicine, then food, then sleep, sex and gender, parenthood and relationship, childhood, school, becoming adults, culture and consciousness, and the fourth frontier. Uh, so some of those will be a little bit opaque at this point, but they will become less opaque as we talk about them, and certainly um, if you end up reading the book. So Today, what we're going to do is uh, just read an excerpt from the introduction and then talk about it a little bit. All right. Uh, so this is the this is actually the second half of the introduction. The first half has a story um, of a you know nominally near death experience that we had in our very first season doing field work um, many years ago, which I am not going to read on air here. It was one of our earliest near death experiences. <laughs> it was one of our earliest near death experiences. So I'm going to read from the introduction starting after that story. Many people have attempted to explain the cultural dissolution we face, but most have failed to provide a holistic explanation that not only examines our present, but also looks back into our past, our whole past, and into the future. We are evolutionary biologists who have done empirical work on sexual selection and the evolution of sociality, and theoretical work on the evolution of trade-offs, senescence, and morality. We are also married to each other, have a family together, and have often been side by side while exploring many parts of the globe. Well, over a decade ago, when we were still college professors, we began formulating the idea for this book. We stood on the shoulders of giants, our mentors and senior colleagues, as well as many intellectual ancestors whom we never met, but we're also building curriculum that was unlike any that came before. We forged new paths and posited new explanations for patterns, both old and new. We came to know our undergraduate students well, and as they engaged our curricula, they asked questions across domains. What should I be eating? Why is dating so difficult? How do we create a more just and free society? The common threads throughout these conversations, in classrooms and labs, in jungles and around campfires, were logic, evolution, and science. 
Science is a method that oscillates between induction and deduction. We observe patterns, propose explanations, and test them to see how well they predict things we do not yet know. We thus generate models of the world that, when we do the scientific work correctly, achieve three things. They predict more than what came before, assume less, and come to fit with one another, merging into a seamless whole. Ultimately, in this book and with these models, we seek a single consistent explanation of the observable universe that has no gaps, takes nothing on faith, and rigorously describes every pattern at every scale. This goal almost certainly cannot be attained, but there is every indication that it can be approached. Though we may glimpse this endpoint from our modern perch, we are a long way from reaching the limits of what can be known. That said, we are much closer to the goal in some areas than in others. In physics, we seem tantalizingly near a theory of everything, which really means a complete model of the least complex, most fundamental layer of explanation. And here we've endnoted your brother Eric Weinstein's work. As we move up in complexity, things become less and less predictable. Near the top of the stack, we reach biology, where processes inside even the simplest living cells are nowhere near fully understood. Things only get more complex from there. As cells begin to function in coordinated ways, becoming organisms made up of distinct tissues, the degree of mystery compounds. The unpredictability jumps again in animals, governed by sophisticated neurological feedbacks that themselves investigate and predict the world, and once again as animals become social and begin to pool their understanding and divide their labor. Nowhere are we more regularly stumped than we are in understanding ourselves. We homo sapiens are brimming over with profound mysteries, surrounded by paradoxes born of the very things that make us distinct from the rest of the biota. Why do we laugh, cry, or dream? Why do we mourn our dead? Why do we make up stories about people who never lived at all? Why do we sing, fall in love, go to war? If it's all about reproduction, why do we take so many years to get on with it? Why are we so picky about with whom we choose to do it? Why are we fascinated by the reproductive behavior of others? Why do we sometimes choose to impair and disrupt our own cognition? The list of human mysteries is endless. This book will address many of those questions. It will bypass others. Our primary aim here is not to simply answer questions, but to introduce you to a robust scientific framework for understanding ourselves, one we have developed over decades of study and teaching on the topic. It is not a framework you will find elsewhere. We developed it by working from first principles as much as possible. First principles are those assumptions that cannot be deduced from any other assumption. They are foundational, like axioms and math, and so thinking from first principles is a power me powerful mechanism for deducing truth, and a worthy goal if you are interested in fact over fiction. Among the many benefits of first principles thinking is that it helps one avoid falling prey to the naturalistic fallacy, which is the idea that what is in nature is what ought to be. The framework that we present here is built to free us from these sorts of traps. It is intended to allow us humans to make sense enough of ourselves that we can, at a minimum, protect ourselves from self-inflicted harm. In this book, we will identify the most large-scale problems of our time, not through the limiting, divisive lens of politics, but through the indiscriminate lens of our evolution. One of our hopes is that we can help you to see through the noise of our modern world and become a better problem solver. Modern Homo sapiens arose approximately 200,000 years ago, the product of 3.5 billion years of adaptive evolution. We are, in most ways, a generic species. Our morphology and physiology, though staggering and marvelous when considered in isolation, are not special when compared to those of our nearest relatives. But we, uniquely, have transformed the globe and become a threat to the planet on which we still thoroughly depend. We might have called this book a post-industrialist's guide to the 21st century, or an agriculturalist's guide, or a monkey's guide, or a mammal's guide, or a fish's guide. Every one of those represents a stage of evolutionary history to which we have adapted and from which we carry evolutionary baggage, our environment of evolutionary adaptedness, or EEA, to use the term of art. In this book, we speak to our environments of envi evolutionary adaptedness, which is to say not just the EEA of the title, such as the African grasslands and woodlands and coasts on which our ancestors were hunter-gatherers for so long, but the many other EEAs to which we are adapted. We emerged onto land as early tetrapods, became lactating, fur-bearing mammals, developed dexterity with our hands and visual acuity as monkeys, grew and harvested our own food as agriculturalists, and lived cheek to jowl with millions of anonymous others as post-industrialists. We chose to include hunter-gatherer in the title of the book because our recent ancestors spent millions of years adapting to that niche. This is the reason so many people romanticize this particular phase of our evolution. But there was not just one hunter-gatherer way of life any more than there was one mammalian way of life or a single way to farm. And we are not adapted only to being hunter-gatherers. We also adapted long ago to being fish, more recently to being primates, and most recently to being post-industrialists. All of these <clears throat> are part of our evolutionary history. <clears throat> 
This wide-ranging view is necessary if we are to understand the biggest problem of our time. Our species' pace of change now outstrips our ability to adapt. We are generating new problems at a new and accelerating rate, and it is making us sick, physically, psychologically, socially, and environmentally. If we don't figure out how to grapple with the problem of accelerating novelty, humanity will perish, a victim of its success. This is a book not only about how our species is in danger of, oops, sorry. This is a book not only about how our species is in danger of destroying our world, it is also about the beauty that humans have discovered and created and how we can save it. An irrefutable evolutionary truth undergirding this book is that humans are excellent at responding to change and adapting to the unknown. We are explorers and innovators by design, and the same impulses that have created our troublesome modern condition are the only hope for saving it. I'm excited. I am too. Um, I'm very excited for this to be out in the world and for us to be sharing pieces of it uh, as, as the weeks go on. Is there anything you want to add uh, to that part of the introduction that I have just read from? Yeah, I mean, there are a number of things in there that are key. Many of them will be familiar to longtime viewers and listeners. I think the idea, you know, I'm particularly fond of the idea that the goal is a seamless integration of models at every level and that that cannot be achieved and we already know it, but it probably can be approached, which is effectively the same thing. That that's a really important and subtle distinction. And if people understand that that's what you're doing, it's not that you arrogantly think that actually a theory of everything is actually gonna allow you to go from the particle level to predicting the next behavior of the person in front of you, nothing of the kind. But the compatibility of all of these things is the objective. And the fact that they are wildly incompatible at the moment tells us what we need to figure out, right? It's the incompatibility between things that uh, drives proper inquiry. It is that, it is an, a kind of perverse obsession with the inconsistency that turns you into a scientist, right? The need to figure out how A and B can both simultaneously be true when they seem incompatible. As we say later in the book, paradoxes are like an X on a treasure map. Right. right. They say, dig here, figure like what, what is this inconsistency about? Uh, in, in a scientific worldview, worldview, you don't say, ah, oh, let's agree to disagree. Let's figure out what the source of the disagreement is and, uh, and figure out, you know, who, who's got the perspective that isn't actually a match for what is true. Even if it is best for the majority of people actually to agree to disagree and wait for somebody else to figure out what fills in the gap. You don't necessarily sure. want a society full of people obsessed with the inconsistencies. You might not be able to do anything, include feed mm -hmm. yourself, if that's the, uh, the construction of your civilization. But a division of labor in which some people are obsessed by those inconsistencies and driven to do all of the what seems like spinning of your wheels that is necessary in order to finally figure out what fits in these gaps, which is often, you know, you can spend literally decades chasing something. And what you find is some elegant little thing that takes just a minute to describe, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that is a weird kind of investment regime, right? It's like having to drill thousands of oil wells to find one, but the one carries the necessary fluid to fuel what you're up to. And so anyway, I'm very excited uh, that what we have been doing kind of more or less off the cuff on Dark Horse and what we did in the classroom at, uh, you know, very different between you and me, but a higher level of, uh, you know, preparedness lectures that had been developed over years were deployed, upgraded each year and all of that, that that milieu now has a kind of third place that it lives, which is this book where we've taken um, the toolkit and tried to get it into a form where it's sort of, you can hand it off, right? Yeah. And, uh, anyway, yeah, so I'm... this is um, perhaps the most uh, conscious manifestation of our efforts to use the model that we introduce, that we, we talked about in the talk we gave at Princeton virtually about a year ago, that we introduce in the first chapter of the book and speak to a lot more in the 12th chapter of the book, culture versus consciousness. Yeah. yeah. And it's, I mean, I must say the experience of building it has been totally educational to me. You wrote a book before. I've never been part of uh, book writing before. And, you know, th that process, even within an individual article where you lose objectivity about what you've said, and so you're sort of in a race against time to get it out before you forget what it even looks like, um, that's compounded so much in this circumstance because you're dealing not only with the individual topics, but you're dealing with, you know, how they fit together and what you maybe said in a draft and then it's not there anymore, but it needs to be. And so anyway, I'm, I'm shocked and I must say 
almost all of the work that went into keeping track of what we did and didn't say and making sure that we got it all um, sayable and clear. And, you know, the, the immense job of writing the book is not what I had no idea what it even was until we engaged in this project. And that work was almost all you. I never could have kept track of, you know, a fraction of what was necessary to get this into a form that uh, people can read it. So, well, <clears throat> here it is. Proofs soon to be an actual bound book. even ah, that, no, that I just did at FedEx or something. Know, but. All right. Um, one, just one more thing. So we got handed, um, I, I didn't actually know this because my first book didn't have an index, or maybe it did, actually, I don't know, and it's not in this room. Um, but I don't remember anything about how my first book, which is about my research and life in Madagascar when I was in graduate school, Antipode. Um, I don't remember anything about how the index, if it exists even, uh, was created. So we just got handed uh, a draft index that was created by someone at the publisher uh, yesterday. And... Um, <clears throat> Just began looking through it, and I, I admit to have a really geeky fondness for for indexes and books. It's sometimes the thing. If I'm back in the days when browsing in bookshops was a thing, and I love doing it, and I hope to be really comfortable and excited about doing it again any day now, uh, when you know everyone else is also engaged in that sort of thing, um, I, I will often actually look to the index first, just to to see what kinds of topics got pulled out, right? And so um, I think each week we'll just. We'll just sort of throw a dart, and um, craziest index ever. I I I love it. So just just the first one is this like eight things at the letter R. Just what begins the letter R in the index? We have of this hunter gatherer's guide to the twenty first century: radial symmetry, rape, rapid eye movement, sleep, rat enrichment experiments, ravens, raw food diets, and rays. Rays. Rays, as in skates and rays. Skates and rays. As, as, in, um, as in the other half of the... Um, it's the chondrichthyes and the elasmobranchs are sharks, skates, and rays. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Mm -hmm. This episode of the Dark Horse Podcast brought to you by the letter R. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah, maybe we should have... Uh, have our excellent producer put together a Sesame Street style. Uh, this this episode brought to you by uh, whatever by the letter, letter R and the prime number eighty three. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah, we're doing Sesame Street for adults here.